this is the most important video I have made to date. And I want you to really focus on the information and overall message I'm sharing today. In this video, we are going to discuss PM10 and PM2.5 and the differences between the two air quality standards. We'll define what they mean. And also we are going to A, discuss how important or reliable they are when trying to figure out the quality of our air and B, how this all relates to choosing a sufficient air purification solution for our needs in our specific environments. And I'm drawing many important conclusions that I believe affect everyone's health literally for years to come. So please listen carefully. We will start with PM10. The PM part stands for particulate matter and the 10 stands for particles from 10 microns in diameter to 2.5 microns in diameter. If you remember from my last video, humans can only see particles that are 40 microns in size and larger with the naked eye. So we cannot actually see particles that are 10 microns and smaller. For scale, a human strand of hair is about 70 microns, give or take 30 microns, depending on the thickness of the hair. PM10 is suspended coarse particulate matter, and they can be either solid or liquid. Again, from the last video, there are three main types of particulate matter. Coarse particles, which are 2.5 to 100 microns in diameter, and they make up only 1% of the air we breathe. Fine particles, which are 0.1 to 2.5 microns, which make up 9% of all the particles in the air that we breathe and ultrafine particles, which are 0 0.003 microns to 0 0.1 microns, and they make up 90% of the particles in the air that we breathe. PM10 falls under the coarse particles heading. PM10 can be floating dust or aerosols. We all know what dust is, but we may not all know the definition of aerosol. An aerosol may be defined as a suspension of particles or droplets in the air, and some examples of this are airborne dust, mists, fog, haze, fumes, or even smoke. All are considered aerosols. So PM10 includes a wide variety of particles such as smoke, dust, soot, mold, pollen, salts, acids, and even metals. The current federal health standard for PM10 is set at 150 milligrams per cubic meter of air average over a 24-hour period and 50 milligrams per cubic meter of air for an annual average. A milligram per cubic meter is a unit of measure for concentration. We're not gonna get too technical with this. Just know it's a measurement of particle concentration and air per cubic meter. The more particles in the air, the higher the concentration. The less particles in the air, the lower the concentration. Of note, these standardizations were set in 1987 for PM10 and they haven't changed since then. This is an important point and one we're gonna come back to later. Now let's talk about PM 2.5. PM 2.5 focuses on smaller particles, which are 2.5 microns in diameter and less. I find the and less part of the definition to be very vague. So I tried to find the exact definition of what and less exactly means. I mean, 2.5 and less is a very great answer. 2.5 is the ceiling, so what exactly is the floor on the standard? So I did some checking around and received some different answers from different sources, which is par for the course when you're researching information on smaller particulates. Some sources say PM 2.5 goes down to fine particles and the smallest size fine particles would end at 0.1 microns. But chat GPT says PM 2.5 also encompasses ultra fine particles. So I'm gonna go with that definition for PM 2.5 and if it's incorrect, don't blame me. I'll just throw ChatGPT under the bus. <laughs> and as you can see, there appears to be some confusion from source to source as to the correct size particles that PM 2.5 actually deal with. That said, if ChatGPT is correct and that's the true floor, then PM 2.5 focuses on particles from 2.5 microns all the way down to 0 0.003 microns. PM 2.5 can remain suspended in the air for long periods of time and can be absorbed deep into the bloodstream upon inhalation. Examples of PM 2.5 particles include motor combustion, stoves, fireplaces, and home wood burning, smoking, dust, soot, dirt, windblown salt, pollen, and smoke from wildfires. And it can also include some chemical reactions between gases such as black carbon, mineral dust, and VOCs. VOCs stand for volatile organic compounds, which are typically off-gassing from man-made products like the smell of a new car, the smell of new paint on the wall, 
or new carpeting and so forth. Let's go over some of the differences on how PM10 and PM2.5 affect our health. Our bodies can more easily defend against PM10 by sneezing or coughing because they're larger particulates. But those defenses don't really work with smaller particulates. PM10 can embed within the lungs where they are associated with adverse health impacts such as lung tissue damage and asthma. However, PM10 isn't as likely to enter the bloodstream as PM2.5 due to its larger size. PM2.5's microscopic size increases its potential to be lodged deep into the respiratory tracts. At 2.5 microns and smaller, PM2.5 is capable of entering the circulatory system and even the brain. Short-term symptoms of exposure to high levels of this particular matter include irritation of the throat and airways, coughing, and difficulty breathing. More serious long-term complications can include heart and lung disease, bronchitis, emphysema, non-fatal heart attacks, irregular heartbeat, asthma, and more intense flare-ups, decreased lung function, and early death. So with the smaller particulates, we're talking about some serious quality of life issues. A 2011 study published in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine tracked 1.2 million Americans from 1982 until 2008. Each 10 microgram per cubic meter increase in PM2.5 concentrations was associated with a 15 to 27% increase in lung cancer mortality. Basically, an increase in the concentration of particles in the air per cubic foot increased lung cancer mortality dramatically. Now, this next part is very important for people to understand and grasp. On December 14th, 2012, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, aka the EPA, strengthened the nation's air quality standards for fine particle pollution to improve public health protection by revising the primary annual PM2.5 standard from 15 micrograms to 12 micrograms per cubic meter. So in 2012, the EPA lowered the concentration of particles in the standardization for PM2.5 that they considered to be acceptable for good air quality. From a whole number perspective, they lowered the standard by 20%. And then 11 years later, on January 6th, 2023, after carefully reviewing the most recent available scientific evidence and technical information and consulting with the agency's independent scientific advisors, the EPA announced its proposed decision to revise the primary annual PM2.5 standard from its current level of 12 micrograms per cubic meter to within the range of 9 to 10 micrograms per cubic meter. So in the beginning of 2023, the EPA again lowered the concentrations of PM2.5 that they considered to be acceptable for good air quality. So they lowered the concentration standard another 16% from 2012 to 2023. So that means they lowered the concentration standard 33% in a little over 10 years if we look at it from a whole number perspective. So some of the air that was considered to be acceptable and good 12 years ago suddenly is not considered good quality air anymore. The revisions were based on new data that they obtained over time. This is super relevant to today's standardizations and what we consider to be good air quality. So the obvious question that I have is, what are they going to consider to be good air quality for PM 2.5 in 10 years from today? How about 20 years from today when they have even more reliable data? They are already showing us that the trend for what they consider to be good air quality is going in a less concentrated direction for smaller particulates. The larger particulate PM 10 standard hasn't changed since 1987, but the smaller PM 2.5 concentration standard has decreased 33% in the past 11 years again for whole numbers. And most everyone agrees that PM 2.5 and the ultrafine particles comprise over 90% of the air we breathe, and they are the most hazardous and dangerous to humans. But they are hard to test for, and we don't really know to what extent they impact our overall health over time. There have been many studies done, of course, but there will be many more in the coming years. There are going to be a lot more accurate testing solutions available. Some companies are integrating AI into their air quality testing solutions today, and there will be much more sophisticated data analytics over the next 10 to 20 years that may force the EPA to lower the PM 2.5 concentration standards again. In fact, 
I am almost certain that within the next 10 to 20 years, the EPA will lower the floor and the parameters on the standardization on what will be considered good air quality for small particulates as they learn more in the future. So some of what we consider to be good air quality today will not be considered good air quality in 10 to 20 years. I believe this is where the industry is trending. And everything I just said makes a lot of sense to me. Of note, there are also newer classifications for particles, but they do not currently have standardizations. Recently, they've added PM 0.1, PM 0.3, PM 0.5, PM 4, and PM 5. Three of them are smaller in size than the current PM 2.5 standard. And to me, this just shows us the smaller particles are harder to test for, they are harder to study, and it's harder to understand the dynamics about them and how they affect our overall health, especially in the long term. I do think there will eventually be standardizations for these five new PM sizes as time goes on and more is learned about them. And I also think there will be a larger emphasis on the smaller size particles in the future as we learn about how they are more damaging to our health. So I would keep this information in mind when choosing an air purification solution. Even I am rethinking my home air purification strategy. I believe I'm gonna start replacing my good air purifiers with ones that filter even more efficiently at a lower particle level. As you may have seen me mention in other videos, I think 90% or more of the air purifiers on the market that say they have HEPA filters in them actually don't filter at a HEPA level. And even if you have an air purifier that legitimately filters at a HEPA level, how much of the ultrafine particles less than 0.3 microns, which is the HEPA standard, do they actually filter? IQ Air says, Good HEPA filters only filter 37% of the ultrafine particles in the air that we breathe. And if 90% of all the particles I breathe in the air are ultrafine and lower than the HEPA standardization, is 37% good enough for me and my long-term health? This is the type of question I'm beginning to ask myself. I used to think if I'm not coughing or sneezing much in my house and I don't get sick that often, that my current air purification solutions are adequate for my needs but I'm beginning to think differently. What if the EPA comes out in 10 years and lowers the standardizations again, and we realize that there are massive long-term health benefits to filtering our air better than HEPA and better than 37% for fine particles. I'm currently 53 years old, so I'll be 63 years old at that point in time. And I would think, geez, it would have been nice to have heard that 10 years ago. So I'm kind of looking at where the direction of the revised standardizations are trending, which is obviously down towards the smaller particulates. I'm looking at the new PM numbers and three are less than PM 2.5, which shows a focus on smaller particulates as well. And I'm thinking the air testing industry is really in the early stages of development these days, but today there is more money better technology, and more brain power being thrown at the air testing industry than ever before. And this huge global concerted effort will probably accumulate a ton of new data and insights over the next 10 to 20 years, and it is almost certainly going to point us towards filtering the smaller, more dangerous particles even more efficiently than we consider to be adequate today. So I plan on being ahead of the curve. I'm not going to wait 10 years or so for the EPA to tell me something I think I already know today. Hey, I could be wrong about this, but I doubt it. And here is some additional information that supports my current stance on this issue. This short article is from The Guardian, May of 2019, and it's called Revealed. Air pollution may be damaging every organ in the body. Comprehensive analysis finds harm from head to toe, including dementia, heart and lung disease, fertility problems, and reduced intelligence. Air pollution may be damaging every organ and virtually every cell in the human body, according to a comprehensive new global review. The research shows head-to-toe harm from heart and lung disease to diabetes and dementia, and from liver problems and bladder cancer to brittle bones and damaged skin. Fertility, fetuses, and children are also affected by toxic air, the review found. The systematic damage is the result of pollutants causing inflammation that then floods through the body and ultrafine particles being carried around the body by the bloodstream. Air pollution is a public health emergency, according to the World Health Organization, with more than 90% of the global population enduring toxic outdoor air. But of note, many folks will say your indoor air quality can be even 10 times, even 100 times worse than the outdoor air quality. So this is really an indoor and outdoor air quality issue for sure, as most Americans spend the lion's share of their time indoors. 
New analysis indicates 8.8 million early deaths each year, which is double early estimates, making air pollution a bigger killer than tobacco smoking. So most sources I've recently seen have stated the annual early deaths at about 4 million a year. But again, with new and better data, they literally doubled that number. Again, the health consequences are trending in a negative direction based on new information. But the impact of different pollutants on many ailments remains to be established, suggesting well-known heart and lung damage is only the tip of the iceberg. Air pollution can harm acutely as well as chronically, potentially affecting every organ in the body, conclude the scientists from the Forum of International Respiratory Societies in the two review papers published in the journal Chest. Ultrafine particles pass through the lungs, are readily picked up by cells, and carried via the bloodstream to expose virtually all cells in the body. Professor Dean Schroffnagel at the University of Illinois at Chicago, who led the reviews, said, I wouldn't be surprised if almost every organ was affected. If something is missing from the review, it is probably because there was no research yet. The review represents very strong science, said Dr. Maria Nira, the WHO Director of Public and Environmental Health. It adds to the very healthy evidence we have already. There are more than 70,000 scientific papers to demonstrate that air pollution is affecting our health. She said she expected even more impacts of air pollution to be shown by future research. Issues like Parkinson's or autism, for which there is some evidence, but maybe not the very strong linkages, that evidence is coming now. So in the past, I used to think that not everybody needed an air purifier. Early in my career, I'd only recommended air purifiers to people with breathing problems or allergies who basically called me to consult with them about these issues. And I'd oftentimes tell some people who didn't really appear to have an immediate pressing need and who wanted to just, you know, improve their overall air quality in general, that they could just go with, you know, a less expensive model just to, you know, help improve their general air quality if that is what they were looking for. But after a lot more research and specifically learning about some of the hazards of ultrafine particles and how they can affect our future health, I am changing my opinion on this, and I currently think it is in everyone's best interest to obtain the best air purification solutions their budget can handle, specifically ones that do a good job of filtering ultrafine particles, as these appear to be the ones that affect us the most. It is an important investment in your current health and maybe even more of an issue for your future health. I am very confident future data and discoveries and the air purification testing industry will support my new current stance on this issue. I am not waiting for a big name mainstream source to confirm this in the future, nor do I need to wait for the EPA to lower standardizations again or create new standardizations for the recently created lower size PM numbers either. I feel I already have enough information today to form an educated opinion and my health and my family's health are too important to wait for an official stamp of approval on this issue. So yeah, at this point, I'm gonna really focus on ultra fine particulate filtering solutions for my own home. Please click on this video here to learn how PM10 and PM2.5 relate to the AQI, the air quality index. And we'll also discuss how accurate the AQI is and how relevant it is to the quality of our air. Thank you.